Okay, back to my friend. Actually, what they called me about, uh, John Erling on the radio, they were having a heated discussion on the radio about marriage, uh, you know, whether it's between men and women or whether it matters and gender orientation, the big American topic. And they were talking about it on the radio. And one of the men said, hey, there's a, the new pastor. We got to have him weigh in on it. So their real question when we came back from the break was, how do you know that marriage is between one man and one woman? How do you know that God created males and females? And so after the break, they hit me with that. And I said, because Jesus believed it. And I took him to Matthew 19. When Jesus talks about marriage, he says, in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, and so for you, just to solidify in your mind, there are seven reasons why I believe the Bible's true. But the most important one is the first one. Jesus authenticated the Bible. Jesus didn't just believe the message. When Jesus argued with the Pharisees, did you know he even talked about the words? Jesus believed in what we would call verbal inspiration. Jesus believed every word was inspired, not just the thoughts. Now, your generation, uh, they don't even think the words are inspired. The, the Christian colleges in America don't hold the Christian colleges, I'm not talking about state universities, they don't hold to literal inspiration, verbal, plenary inspiration. The Christian colleges, there are only a handful that really do. Uh, so you're in a, I'm glad you're at Word of Life because they do believe in it. Okay, seven reasons why I believe the Bible is true and I trust you do too. Jesus believed it. By the way, the apostles and prophets believed it. All of them, I mean all of the Bible writers just said, I'm speaking for God. I mean, they totally believed it. Uh, number three, the survival of God's word. And over the 25 hours, we're going to share these two weeks. You're going to hear me tell stories. Uh, Bonnie and I just came from Hungary. Uh, one of the things we did in Hungary was we went out with, we, we had a film crew there. I, I talked to them about something I did when I was your age. I used to smuggle Bibles into the communist countries and into the Muslim countries. When I was a college student your age, and we went to one of the places where, uh, where I used to do that. It was amazing. But that is this line, the survival of God's word. There was a point in the Roman Empire in the year 303 that the emperor decided he wanted to get rid of every Bible, every Bible in the early church. Did you know he succeeded? There is not a complete copy of the Bible that predate, <clears throat> predates uh, Diocletian, <clears throat> excuse me. But yet the Bible survived. It's the same way it survived in the communist world. When I delivered Bibles to churches in Russia or East Germany or Poland or Hungary or wherever, they would take the Bible right away and do this. They'd tear off a whole book and give it to one family. They'd tear off another book and give it to the next family and so that one Bible was spread throughout all the families of the church. When the police came and searched your home, they'd only get Titus. But the other 65 books were safe. That's what happened with Diocletian in the Roman Empire. He said, I am going to destroy every church building. I'm going to destroy every Bible. And I'm going to kill every pastor. It's the closest Christianity came to extinction ever because Diocletian was very methodical. He's the only Roman emperor that retired. He didn't get killed on the battlefield. He didn't get assassinated and he didn't dissipate his life. He retired. Dubrovnik is his, his castle. That's the huge site that everybody likes to go to. He was an amazing man that proved the survival of God's word. All he did is break the Bible up into 25,000 little pieces. And that's how many manuscripts we have today of the New Testament. And God has made his word survive. Uh, number four, none of the Bible writers, or very few of them, ever met each other. I'm talking about the Old Testament writers. They didn't know each other. 
They didn't pal around together. You know, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they are 70 years apart. They didn't know each other yet. All of their books completely agree with one another. We call that the absolute unity of the scriptures. Number five, prophetic accuracy. My favorite prophecy for all of you, um, and, and it's amazing, I take people there all the time. Have you guys done the Israel trip yet? Is that still something you do? Okay. When you get to Israel and you go to the Wailing Wall and all that, right next to it, Steve will probably take you to this pile of stones. And they're, they're just like this. They're about five tons each. And here is the Dome of the Rock. And this is the foundation wall of the Temple Mount. And these are the stones that used to be the temple and the buildings that were built up here in Jesus' time. And in Matthew 24, verses 1 to 4, Jesus was walking with the disciples through the temple, and they said to him, what's going to happen in the future? Jesus said, you want to know what's going to happen in the future? He says, not one of these buildings are going to be left standing, that the stones... He actually says that in Matthew 24. The stones are going to be thrown down. I always take people to sit on these stones. I say, this is the clearest biblical prophecy that is fulfilled in the Bible. Jesus said in the year A.D. 30, he said, every stone, not one stone is going to be on top of another up here on the Temple Mount. Not one. Did you know today there's not a single trace of the temple of Herod left? Nothing is left. But all the rocks, they weigh tons, are still piled right there where the Romans threw them down. And so I have people sit on there, and I say, you're sitting on the greatest visible prophetic statement in the Bible fulfilled. Just what Jesus said, all the stones are thrown down. And then while they're sitting there, I take them to Zechariah 12 to 14. And you know what it says there? It says the world will end when all nations are saying from the river to the sea. You know, that's the chant now in the Palestinian chants. They're saying from the river to the sea. We don't want any Israel left. The, what's going on today is a call around the world for the elimination of Israel. Not, not rein them in, get rid of them. The Bible says the world ends when the whole world isn't just chanting, get rid of Israel, but the whole world marches as in armies on Israel. And that is going to be fulfilled as literally as this. You see, the Bible is prophetically accurate. Every prophecy in the Bible that's been fulfilled has been fulfilled literally. Literally. Not figuratively. But modern day theologians want to take this future of Israel and say, no, that isn't going to be literal. It is going to be literal. Uh, number six, scientific accuracy. Did you know the Bible says that God sits above the circle of the earth? It's the word sphere. Uh, that means that, that the Bible, it says that the earth turns on an axis like clay to the seal. Watch. This is a seal. And if I was signing a, a document in clay, I would hold the seal and roll it and it would turn on a central axis. It would revolve. That's how they signed documents. The seal was on a cylinder, and they rolled it like a rolling pin across a clay tablet. The Bible says that the earth turns on an axis like clay to a seal. And it's a sphere, and God is above the circle of the earth. In other words, 
in the Old Testament, the oldest book, that's in the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible was scientifically accurate. And I, if I was teaching Job, I'd go through about 50 of those. Historically accurate. Uh, it, it says in the Bible that Bethesda has five porches. That's in John 9. Did you know that until 1890, no one believed that was true? Because they didn't know there was a pool of Bethesda. And the French were, were excavating in Jerusalem, and they found out, they, they excavated Bethesda. It's 70 feet underground of rubble. When they got down there, here's a porch. One, so one, two, three, four porches, and they found it had a, a central bridge across the middle, the fifth porch. Just what the Bible said, because it's an eyewitness account. So the Bible's true prophetically, scientifically, historically, uh, because it's true. Now, for you to understand history, the Bible presents this as history that Christ is the center of history, his crucifixion. A thousand years before Christ was David. A thousand years before David was Abraham. A thousand years before Abraham was Noah. And about a thousand years before Noah was Adam. After Christ, in America, for our historical perspective, the Vikings you know, were riding around and conquering stuff in 1000 AD. A thousand years later is us today. The world is going to be around for at least another thousand years. The millennium. The Bible says people are going to be living on earth for 1,000 years after the return of Christ. That is world history. It kind of reminds me of if you were shifting your car. Here's neutral, first, second, third, and then, you know, you'd have your lower gears. There are only, in the Bible, about 7,000 years of history that God says is for humanity. Now, either you believe that it is what it says or you don't. The Old Testament that we have today is made up of 39 books. How did it get into that form? By Ezra. Ezra put the Bible into the, the form that it's in. Uh, by the way, Ezra is most revered next to Moses, to the Jewish people. The number one Jew of all is Moses. The number two Jew of all is Ezra. Here's the reason why. Ezra, number one, invented biblical Hebrew. If you think about it, um, the Jews were in Egypt. So the language that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph spoke, after 400 years in captivity, they were in Egypt. Then they moved to the Promised Land, and so they were in the Promised Land. Then they were hauled off to Babylon. By the time we get to Ezra, almost no Jewish person could read the Old Testament. They couldn't read Genesis, Exodus. They couldn't read all of these books because they had been uh, in the promised land where the Phoenicians were and in the Babylonian captivity. So what Ezra did is Ezra invented block Hebrew, this square writing. You know, uh, the, all of the Hebrew letters fit in a square. You can buy your name in little squares. That's the first thing he did. He did biblical Hebrew. Second thing is he took all of the Old Testament and copied it into this new biblical Hebrew. And number three, why everybody loves him, he started the synagogues. So the Bible we have today is in the order, those, those books, because of Ezra's work. The way the Bible's laid out is the history books, the prophecy books, the wisdom books. But look at this. These were written before the exile, 14 of them. Three, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, are after the exile. The same is true of the prophetic books. Before the exile, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, after. So the last three prophets are post-exilic. The last three history books are after the exile. And look what's right in the middle. A theology of suffering, Job. A theology of worship, Psalms. A theology of how to live, is Proverbs, a theology of life. Now, there's a difference between how to live and life. 
the, the kind of big picture is in Ecclesiastes. The everyday practical how to get along with people is in Proverbs. And then I love Song of Solomon. I wish I was teaching Song of Solomon. Did you know Song of Solomon is about Solomon? In fact, these three books were written by Solomon. This is when he's young. Uh, I, I mean, this is when he's young, in love, Song of Solomon. Then after, in his, you know, kind of parenting years, he wrote Proverbs. And the end of his life, he wrote Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon is a story about Solomon, the richest man in the world, owning all these properties, and there was no social media. So no one knew what he looked like. You ever thought about that? King Solomon was only known up close by a few people because he was the king. So he went one day to one of his farms, not wearing his crown and everything, and he noticed this woman working in one of his farms in a vineyard. And he actually worked with her. That's what the book is. Have you read Song of Solomon lately? It's the most beautiful book. He's working in the, and he falls in love with her, and he tells her, I'm coming back. Wait for me. I'm coming back. And so this normal person that looks just like her, working in the field, leaves her, and the whole book of Song of Solomon is her going, oh, my beloved has gone, I don't know if he's coming. And all of a sudden she goes, and there he comes. And it's all that writing about he's in his chariot, and he's wearing this helmet, and he's got this armor on. And everyone said, it's the owner of the vineyard, the king. And so all the workers are standing like this. And Solomon walks down, takes his helmet off, and walks over and stands in front of her. And she's got her head down. And he said, I told you I'd come back. And she goes, it's you. And it's the most beautiful love story in the world. And it's an amazing book. And it's a theology of love. And it's, I mean, what a great book. But I'm not teaching that. Okay. So wise living is how God describes his will for us. What Proverbs said is, look at this. And this is our generation. What is this? Are you guys X, Y, or Z? Which generation are you guys? What are you? You're millennials? Gen Z. Okay. You're not Gen Z? You are Gen Z. Okay. We're boomers. We're called boomers. Isn't that funny how this is the Gen Z thing? God wants to make me teachable, not stubborn. Do you know what characterizes your generation? This fierce, no one's going to tell me anything. Kind of, I'm going to, I know everything. I've got Google. And I'll look it up, you know. God says, no, I want you to be teachable. Wise people want people that are wise to instruct them. See, the mark of a believer is, remember what I read to you in James 3? The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. Here's the next one. Easily entreated. God says a wise person will receive and love instruction. Someone says, you need to change that in your life. I went to school at a place called Bob Jones University. I got in trouble so many. I was expelled from Bob Jones University. I was so bad, they threw me out of the Christian school. And you know, those were some of the best days of my life because they sat me down and told me all the things I did that were bad. And you know what I said to them? I want to hear it. I don't want I don't want to fail. I want to receive instruction. I don't want to be stubborn. I want to be teachable. So they said, okay, we'll give you another chance. And they took me back. Isn't that amazing? And I became the assistant dean of men. Uh, can you believe it? The next year, I became part of the staff. But why? Because this works. God says, if you're teachable, if you're not stubborn, then you can grow in wisdom. And that's what Proverbs is talking about. Okay, now to apply this. I think we're going to be perpetually one whole hour behind. Do you guys mind just being an hour behind? It's kind of like daylight savings time. Didn't you just have daylight savings time? 
don't, they don't move the hour. In America, they're always moving hours all over the place. So I figure there's an extra hour floating out there somewhere. Okay, let's go to Colossians 2 because I want to apply the book of Proverbs to your Christian life today. Some of you don't feel like you live back with Solomon. And so look at, at Colossians 2, verse 6. This is what it says. As you have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Now back up to verse 3. It says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. Now back up to verse 2. It says, to the riches of the full assurance of understanding, the knowledge of the mystery of God the Father and of Christ. Colossians 2, starting in verse 6, is talking about what happened when we got saved. We began to walk in wisdom. This is what it looks like. This is what walking in wisdom. Walking in wisdom starts with salvation, and salvation comes by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. We heard the gospel. We were convicted by God. We responded. We trusted. We reached out like that lady on the subway as our only hope was Christ, and he saved us. And the Bible says, look at, look at verse 6, as you received Christ, walk in him. Look at this. The same way we get saved, the same way we were saved is how you get the rest of the Christian life. There's no, it's all the same. All of it is by grace through faith. When God says, I want to give you wisdom, it's just like being saved. We can hardly believe it's possible. Life is so hard. And so what we have to do is we just have to come to a point where we say, I believe you. I would like that. And we call out to him. Secondly, I want God's truth to penetrate my life. Look at verse 7. Rooted and built up and established by faith as you have been taught and abounding in it with thanksgiving. I know salvation came by faith. And so a wise person, a Christian says, I want God's truth to penetrate my life. And how do we do that? That's why I talked to you about your journals. You need to, on a daily basis, learn that what you are reading in the Bible, you stop after you read enough that you got a truth and you invite God to do that in your life. Okay, I'll tell you about a Bible study I had. Um, I was at Starbucks. I have to confess that I love coffee. And so I was at Starbucks standing in line and a man, this is in Kalamazoo, Michigan, a man came behind me and he said, hi. And I turned around and said, hi. You know, people are friendly in America. And so I said, hi. He said, uh, I know who you are. I said, good to meet you. Thank you. He said, I want you to lead a Bible study. I said, you don't go to Calvary. He said, no. He said, none of us go to Calvary. But he said, we're all at the top of our careers. He was about 40. He said, there are a group of eight of us. And he said, we're all at the top of our careers. We all own our own business. He said, all of us are millionaires. All of us have wonderful families. He said, all of us are, are very successful. But he said, we've decided it's time to get serious about God. They were all Christians, too. But they were just normal Christians. You know, kind of like they went to church and left. And they weren't involved. They just went and left. And so I said, are you serious? I said, this would be one of the most fun Bible studies I've ever had. He said, I'm serious. And so this was in 2000, I think, 14 or 2015, you know, about seven, eight, nine years ago. And I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. I will meet with you for one year, 52 weeks, for one hour a week, and I said, and you have, to, you have to come to all of them with your group. And I said, you have to participate. And they said, that's why we ask you. That's a year, an hour a week, we're committed. And I said, you have to do the homework. And they said, yes. So I, I said, all you need, your only gear is you need your Bible and your notebooks. And I assigned them. And I called it the 52 greatest chapters in the Bible. 
I said, I'm going to survey the whole Bible with you. There are 52 chapters of the Bible that if you study those, you understand every doctrine, every theological point, every event, prophecy, salvation, everything are summarized in those 52 books. He said, we'll do it. So I met with him the first week and we studied, you know, Colossians. And let's keep, we actually did this. So I'm doing one of the studies that we did. Here it is, number three. I said, you know what it says in verse 11? Look at verse 11. In him you were crucified with crucifixion made without hands, putting off the body of the sins, the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I said, what is, that's a hard verse. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? And I said, this is what I wrote in my journal. I have a heart that is new. God has given me the ultimate, never needing to be upgraded operating system. Ezekiel says, a new heart also I have given you, a new spirit I put within you. I'll take away your stony heart. So I said, that's a truth. Then we kept studying. We had an hour together. I said, look at verse 12. It says this. Buried with him in baptism, raised with him through faith, who raised him from the dead. I said, baptism portrays the fact that our past, all of our sins, everything, are forever gone. I have a past that's buried. I have a heart that's new. Look at this. Look at verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. I have a fresh new beginning. I'm like a baby. That's why we're called born again. We have no past, just a future with God. And so I went through all these studies with him. And I said, now, I want you this week to do the same thing that we're doing. Keep going. And this is what they had to do. Look at verse 14. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. What that means is, Jesus took my guilt, my punishment, the pain for all my sins, and nailed them to Christ's cross. I don't need to punish myself for what Jesus has already been punished for. And then we studied the life of Joseph. Remember Joseph? His brothers tore his coat, put blood on it, threw him in a pit, sold him as a slave. They wanted to kill him. And when 20 years passed, Joseph stood in front of them as the second in command. By the way, when I was teaching in um, England, I took my class to see that pharaoh. Did you know the pharaoh that Joseph stood in front of is one of the most prominent pharaohs and there are more sculptures of him in the British Museum than almost any other pharaoh. And I took the class and I stood next to him. I said, this is Senuraset III right here. And I mean, th he had three giant statues of himself in the British Museum. And I said, look up at his face. You can see his face. They call him the wingnut pharaoh. His ears stick out like this, away from his head, straight out like that. He's so visible in the museum. I said, look in his face. That's the guy that elevated Joseph to be prime minister. Now turn to Genesis and look what Joseph said. Because it can change your life, especially if you ever had a rough beginning. Uh, you know, kind of like any kind of abuse. Genesis 41, 51. And Joseph called the name of his firstborn son Manasseh. Here's what Manasseh, that's a Hebrew word. Do you know what that word means? God has made me forget. And Joseph interpreted the meaning of his son's name by, God made me forget all my toil and my father's house. God gives us the key to deal with our past. Joseph testified after 20 years of horrible abuse, God transformed him so he was no longer crippled by past abuse, God dealt with it. Do you know what your generation is? Crippled by past abuse. Do you know how many kids are in therapy because someone hurt them, their parents, their teacher, their whoever? And they're, 
not only in therapy, they're, they're being medicated for it. They're basically almost not operating in life. And you know what? Joseph, Joseph should have been like that. He was almost murdered. He was hated by his brothers. He was cruelly treated. He was sold. He was a slave. By the way, after he stood up for the Lord and obeyed, what did Potiphar's wife do? Falsely accused him and sent him to worse prison. What did Joseph say about it? Look at verse 52. And the name of my second son is Ephraim. What does Ephraim or Ephraim mean? God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. That's Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together. What did Joseph say? I have the end of all guilt. Jesus took my punishment and pain for my sins. All of that's been nailed to the cross. And all the people who have abused me and horribly treated me and everything cannot cripple me. Because God, God, number one, has made me forget. And God, number two, has made me fruitful. So we did that. And then the next one I showed him is verse 15. Look at Colossians 2, 15. Disar having disarmed the principalities and the powers, he made a public spectacle. He triumphed over them. What Paul's telling the Colossians is, I don't have to fear. Jesus has disarmed the power of Satan to ever destroy me. Only Christ can protect me. All I have to do is trust him. And so I told the men, I said, I want you to go home. And I want you to say, here's me. Here are all the parts of my life, all the abuse, all the problems, all the struggles, all the fears. And I said, I want you to write a prayer that, that reflects this. And I said, there, there's another one. Starting in verse 16 of Colossians 2. Let no one judge you in food or regard to a festival. There are shadow of things to come. Let no one cheat you. All the way through verse 23, these things. I said, I have a life that's free. From now on, I know Christ is my life. His word is my guide. I can resist those who try and lay their hurtful barbs and crippling control on my heart. Christ has set me free. This is all the rules that people put on you. And I said, I want you to write a prayer from all those things we studied. So we met the next week, these eight millionaire successful businessmen. I said, who wants to be first reading their prayer? They said, no, I'm not going to. They said, I'm not going to read a prayer. I'm not going to say in front of everybody else what I'm struggling with, what I need God to change in my life. I'm not going to do that. And I said, wait a minute. We agreed one week ago to meet for 52 weeks, spend an hour a week getting ready, and then studying all week long and coming back together and writing what we found. I said, okay, I'll read my prayer. And this, I typed it out for you. Lord, I want to set my minds in these truths from you since I am raised with Christ. I'm choosing to set my mind on things above. I'm asking you to reset me to your settings of wisdom and away from my own way. And then I went on through and reflected, I have a life that is freed. I have nothing to fear. Uh, it's the end of all guilt. Whoop. Uh, I have a heart that is new. My past is buried. I have a fresh new beginning. I don't have to be guilty. I don't have to be afraid. I'm free in Christ. That's your project, only you're doing it from Proverbs, not Colossians. And if you learn to live that way, that's how you every day make sure that your shopping cart at Emart that you dump in front of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. When you say, this is what I spent my precious life living for, and Jesus takes it, and it goes through a fire. It says that, remember, we read that. At the other end of the conveyor belt is Jesus, and whatever doesn't get burned up in my life, he collects. And he said, that, that's the gold and silver and precious stones of your life that were lived the same way you were saved, 
the rest of your life is by faith, trusting me, walking in wisdom, and all of that that you did is what is your eternal reward. And did you know in heaven, all of us are going to shine like the stars. But when you look up at the sky, there are bright stars and there are dim stars. It says, 1 Corinthians 15 says that the stars all differ. How we shine forever is how much of our life doesn't get burned up and how much of it was lived for the Lord. What time is this hour over? 50? I have 13 minutes to do the next lesson. Okay, let's go to number three. Okay, my question is to you, who wrote Proverbs? And did Solomon write any other books? Yeah, Psalms, or I mean, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs, sound good. And he wrote also two. Good. Did David write Proverbs? No. no. But David is talking in Proverbs because he said, my son, you know, and, he, and Solomon's quoting him. But David didn't write Proverbs, Solomon did. So how did Solomon ruin his life? Oh, how do you like this picture? This is when I took our group to Petra. This is uh, uh, in Jordan. This is the Nabataeans. By the way, when Paul was in the desert, remember, with Christ, this is the area that he was when he was three years taught by Christ that talks about that in uh, Galatians. But how did Solomon ruin his life? Now, who was Solomon? He was the richest and smartest man in the world. In fact, that would make a great movie. The richest and smartest Jew who has a thousand wives wants to tell you about life. That's what Solomon was. Uh, where we are in Proverbs is the third. First, we need to be sure we're saved. Second, we need to be sure we've surrendered to God's will. Thirdly, we need to be selective in our friendships. And we need to avoid ruining our life like Solomon did. God says be selective in your friendships. Look at Proverbs 12, 26. And by the way, these that, that I point out are ones I have underlined. I love to underline and mark so that I always see them when I go by them again. But look at verse 26. Oh, my fa Sadie, my favorite reader. Can you read that? The righteous should choose his friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads to mischief. Whoa. The righteous, which is the wise, which are the people that submit to God, should choose their friends, what does it say? Carefully. Okay? God says be selective in your friendships. Why? Do, do any of you, have you memorized in Awana or something, James 4.4? 4, 4? Does anybody know James 4.4? 4? You adulteresses and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. I would give you an Awana buck if, <laughs> if you were an Awana, because you got it. Do you know what God says? If we pick friends that are his enemies and we, we become like them, it ruins our relationship with him. It doesn't get us unsaved. It makes us have enmity with him. And basically, what it says in 1 Kings 11.4 is that Solomon's wives took his heart away from the Lord. Okay, Solomon towers over most who ever lived. He was the richest and the wisest. 1 Kings 3.12, it says, Behold, I have done according to your words. I have given you understanding so that there is no one like you. This is what God said about Solomon. There has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any arise like you, after you. Did you catch that? God said Solomon was the richest and wisest. More than the pharaohs of Egypt, more than Elon Musk, okay, more than anyone, Solomon was the wisest and richest. So he, I mean, he is, he is amazing. Now let's just talk about the context of Proverbs, okay? Solomon had a vast reputation. He was, well, do you remember from Sacred Geography? I showed you this already. Solomon lived in Jerusalem, which is right about there. It's just kind of to the left and above the, the Dead Sea. 
Solomon was right there. Do you know what it says? People from all over the world came to see him and brought him presents. He had, right here, he had a port right down there, and he had another port right there. Did you know that he had boats that would go, what we have found, archaeologists have found in Jerusalem, stuff that he bought from India, stuff from Africa, stuff from all of the Mediterranean. So Solomon was amazing. He, is, he, he had people and goods from all over the world. And Solomon probably wrote his books, the three books, from the three stages of his life. The young man in love, you know, out there in the vineyard with that young lady that didn't know he was the king. Isn't that the way? Marry someone that doesn't know you're rich and famous. Then they marry you for who you really are. Proverbs from him at his zenith when he was the smartest man in the world and Ecclesiastes, when he was old and bitter and looking back on his wasted life. The wisdom that God offered Solomon, he neglected. And I'd like to explain to you why Solomon failed, okay? If you look at Deuteronomy 17, the Bible tells us a secret, which maybe some of you didn't even know. Look at Deuteronomy 17 and verse 18. Um, Remember I said, how long does it take to read the whole Bible? How would you like to copy the whole Bible by hand? Have you ever thought about that? Look at Deuteronomy 17 and verse 18. <clears throat> and it shall be when he, that's the king, sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he himself shall write a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest. Did you catch that? When Solomon became king in 1 Kings 1, 38 to 40, the Bible said that the king was supposed to do his first act as king, which was God's road to lifelong usefulness. What, what was that? Well, a skilled scribe at his peak could copy the words of a page in two to three hours if everything was set for him. Ink, paper, pen, reader, etc. The Pentateuch has... 5,852 verses, 160,000 words. At normal speed, it would take a minimum of 900 hours to do what Deuteronomy 17 said every king is supposed to do. Now think about what it meant to be a king. You became, when Solomon became king, his dad left him a million talents of silver and 100,000 talents of gold. He had an unbeaten army. He, everybody was... David just beat everybody and conquered everybody and gave it all to his son. And God told him the first thing he was supposed to do is he's supposed to copy those 192 pages, those 160,000 words, not have someone else do it for him. He was supposed to take the time to copy the Bible as his first duty. Now, how many of you have ever read Deuteronomy and picked that up? Not very many people notice that. That was the first duty of the king to copy a Bible. And do you know what it says in Deuteronomy? The king was not to multiply horses. Did Solomon multiply horses? Yes or no? Yes. Not multiply wives. How many did he have? Yeah, he had 300 wives, 700 concubines. I mean, he had 1,000. And not multiply gold and silver. Did you know David didn't multiply gold and silver? Do you know what it says in the Bible? Every time David got gold and silver, it says he presented it to the Lord. Solomon didn't. He, he kept it for himself. Okay, God's pathway for Solomon is right there in Deuteronomy 17. And this is what it says. Number one, God must become your personal pursuit. You write for yourself a copy of this law. Did you know my personal goal is to study every chapter of the Bible, just like I'm telling you to do, to actually read it, find every lesson in it, and write an application prayer. Do you know how many times I've done that? My, you ought to see my wall at home. All these, my kids love to come up and see how my handwriting has changed over the years, you know, because the older I get, I'm not just losing my hair, I'm losing, you know, everything. But I want to write for myself a copy 
of what God wants from me. Number two, pursuing God is inconvenient. Think about this. It wasn't something that Solomon could do in his robe and slippers laying in bed. What did it say he's supposed to do? It says you're supposed to go from the copy of the Bible before the priest. Where was that? It was outside the palace. It was outside town. Over there was the tabernacle, and Solomon had to leave his comfortable palace and everybody fanning him and take his gear and go to the tent where it's drafty and smoke from all those candles. It was very inconvenient to do that. Hmm. Sounds like our quiet time, you know? And it shall be, look, this copy you make, it was supposed to be with him. Did you know everywhere Bonnie and I travel, by the way, we travel 10,000 miles a month, 120,000 miles a year. That's how much we travel. Do you know everywhere we go, the one thing I keep with me, just in case the internet goes down, just in case, you know, uh, there's a solar flare, I want a copy of the Bible. This is the most important document in the world. This is everything that we're supposed to know about God and what God desires from us. Solomon was supposed to keep his copy of the Bible with him in the throne. What was that for? To remind him of God's ownership, to remind him of, of all God's expectations. Um, it, it says, not just carry it around. He's supposed to be reading it. Bonnie and I were sitting in, I don't even remember what country we were in, but Bonnie went with uh, some of the staff somewhere else, and I went to Starbucks, of course. And I was sitting at Starbucks reading my Bible, and this man came over to me at my table, and he said, is that the good book? That's what old people call the Bible, the good book. I said, yeah, it's the good book. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm studying it. And he said to me, why? Why? And he looked at me. He said, why would you, a successful American, I guess if you're overseas in Europe and not working, you must be a successful American. He said, why would you read the Bible? And I looked to him and I said, well, I, I don't just read it, I teach it. And I said, actually, I'm going to teach a class in Korea soon about how all the nations of the earth are going to try and eliminate Israel. Boy, did I get his attention. He said, it says that in the Bible? I said, yeah. It doesn't just say that. I reached into my wallet. I said, has anybody ever given to you one of these? Oh, no, honey, I gave you my last one. I always keep a track of my Bible, and Bonnie's always sharing them with someone. I gave, and I pulled out a gospel track. You all know what a gospel track is. It has the plan of salvation. And I said, have you ever read the Bible? He says, oh, I'm a good Catholic. I said, so you probably haven't read the Bible. Good Catholics usually don't. And I said, this is a Bible study. And I was able to share the gospel with that man. Uh, his name was, what was it, honey? Uh, Robin, there we go. Ro that one was Robin. To make a long story short, do you know why that guy came up and bothered me and kept me from studying the Bible? Because he saw me in public reading the Bible. I have shared the gospel with more people than I can count just because I read the Bible at Starbucks and I'm underlining and marking it and people can't understand why anybody would carry around a Bible and mark it. Okay, and it's time to go. So not only should you read it, it should become a lifelong habit all of your days. And spiritual growth takes time because we have to learn uh, from it. And God wants us to carefully observe. And that's why we need to apply it. That's why that application prayer you're working on from Proverbs is so important. And look what it does. It makes us humble, so our hearts are not lifted up. The king was not to think he was better or greater or higher, and he's supposed to submit and not turn aside. I'd like to say you guys are a blessing. Thanks for coming to Word of Life. Thanks for listening, trying to follow the notes, and uh, I hope that, that we'll all learn together. God bless you. Bye-bye.